I hope it was worth the wait. After Denver Public Schools spent thousands of dollars on a month long legal battle, we're now seeing what happened behind closed doors when the school board decided to bring back armed officers in schools. There's video of that meeting, which shows the Denver school superintendent telling board members armed officers would be coming back to schools whether they voted them in or not. He said former Mayor Michael Hancock was going to order the officers in again after a shooting inside East High School hurt two administrators. The former mayor, Hancock, had denied ever saying that. Now we get to bring in Cole Sullivan with no more drama now with this. We're, we're done. This private meeting that didn't need to be private. We're going to see this video and all is going to be okay now. Oh, I wish, Marshall. I wish that was the case. This video from a closed door school board meeting the day after the East shooting. The board was trying to keep it secret, but under legal pressure from Nine News and others, voted to release it earlier today. That full video is not out. DPS said it was struggling to figure out how to upload it. But board member Ayante Anderson tweeted out one clip that shows Marrero telling the board, no matter what they decide, SROs in schools is a done deal. I understand that this is a very problematic conversation to have, but it's going to happen. Um, it's beyond our control. I would hope that it can be our decision, but we are going to be tied to uh, an executive order. At least that's what he told me yesterday evening. At the board's meeting today, several board members implied the vote to release the video was happening now because Hancock isn't in office anymore. So making public the discussion over whether he forced the board's hand on SROs doesn't have the same political risk. Another board member told us that's not why he wanted the video out. Regardless, the clip Anderson has tweeted seems to show the superintendent telling the elected school board the mayor was ready to force their hand, Marshall, on bringing back these officers. I mean I don't want to get into the reasons why or not why right now. That could take uh, minutes. But let's talk about the impact. We still have he said, she said. He said, he said, I should say. We've got the mayor who's previously denied this, who's now out of office, and I know he's on vacation from earlier this week. Haven't heard from him on this yet. But we've got the superintendent saying what he already said publicly. This doesn't resolve that. The video just shows us that. Do we expect any resolution if we see the whole thing? Well, the whole video shows more, right? It's a question of exactly what it will show. We don't have that whole video yet. Again, we're waiting for it. DPS voted earlier today on this. But the real implication here is this was a decision that was a public meeting, public decision. Judge has ruled that it should have been made in public that happened behind closed doors. And bit by bit, we're understanding how this decision was made. If only they had publicized the meeting today, knowing they might decide to put the video out there and prepared for the decision to be let's release it they could they maybe you know upload it ahead of time have it ready to go i think there's like a youtube plus subscription that lets you do that but hey what do i know hopefully we'll see it hey it's not going to be buried on a friday news dump maybe it'll have to wait till monday i know that's going to ruin your story if we don't get it tonight but maybe we'll see it when more people are watching on mondays you know who knows okay thanks cole a former Arapahoe County child services worker is accused of not being honest for a second time. Robin Nicita, who's already accused of calling in false child abuse claims against an Aurora City Councilwoman, has now been indicted, accused of faking a cancer diagnosis to avoid that first case. Nicita was supposed to go to trial in May for the case where she's accused of calling a child abuse hotline and making false claims against Councilwoman Danielle Jarinski. It happened after Jarinski called Nicita's former partner trash. Well, the former partner is Vanessa Wilson, who is now the now former Aurora police chief. If you're following this family tree, great. Nicita and her attorneys claim she was ineligible to stand trial on the false child abuse claim charges due to a brain cancer diagnosis, but prosecutors say Nicita submitted fake medical records to prove her diagnosis, including fake MRIs in a clinic that could not be tracked down. She now faces seven new felony charges and three new misdemeanors about making a fake diagnosis. She'll be back in court next month. Have you heard of the Kansas two-step? No, that was not the Kansas two-step. It's a tactic Kansas state troopers use to try to catch out-of-state drivers with weed. Since marijuana is legal in the bordering states of Colorado and Missouri, and a federal court just found the Kansas two-step unconstitutional. The ACLU of Kansas created the term Kansas two-step and has spent years in court fighting the state patrol maneuver where troopers use a traffic stop as a pretense to search for drugs. No dancing involved. It included a family in Colorado, which was part of the lawsuit. The ACLU argued that troopers use it to target out-of-state drivers on I-70, particularly drivers from Colorado or Missouri, where weed is legal. 
Today, a federal judge kicked the two-step to the side, ruling in favor of the drivers. The judge wrote that pulling somebody over just because they may travel to or from a state where weed is legal is unconstitutional. The court also issued stricter guidelines for troopers to document and record traffic stops. On Mayor Mike Johnston's first day at work, he declared an emergency on homelessness. On Monday, the Emergency Operations Center will be activated. Advocates tell us it's hard, even right now, to find housing resources. And Johnston's goal of 1,000 off the street is by the end of this year. Our Angeline McCall spoke with one organization that's closing their doors to sheltering and says they're encountering obstacles to even get their residents into permanent housing now. Right, and the city says that its 311 line can get over 100 reports per day for encampments solely based on people who are living out on the streets. Now, during the time it takes to reach that goal of getting 1,000 people off the streets, the city's agency that works with the homeless community host says the new administration plans to immediately increase the quality of life for those living on the streets. At the same time, the roadway in a shelter is preparing to close and spoke to us about the difficulty to get people into housing solutions. Right now, they're looking for about 50 or excuse me, 60 people in comparison to 1,000. That's according to Stephanie Kaufman at the gathering place that subcontracted to run the shelter. We are finding it really tough to access some of those resources, such as housing vouchers, permanent supportive housing, some of these housing resources that include a higher level of support that our members need. The roadway in closes at the end of next month and they're already trying to be hopeful and, you know, really optimistic that everyone there will end up finding a place to stay. But it just goes to show how difficult some of these solutions are. Marshall? You know, as journalists, we try to avoid math. I will say when you're subtracting places for people to live and you've got a goal of adding up probably a thousand places for people to live, the math's not working out in the favor of the goal right now. Yeah, I think something that Stephanie talked about is that they're really hoping that with this new announcement from the mayor's office and the new administration that there's a renewed commitment perhaps to opening up more shelter space. So we'll wait and see. You know, we're really waiting to learn what more is part of this, this effort because on Monday um, they're hoping to outline sometime next week the Emergency Operations Center will be up and running uh, for homelessness starting next week. So we're hoping to learn more then. I heard, yeah, Monday we'll, we'll hear all the people who are involved in this and see what the plan is as another announcement is made by the new administration. Thanks, Angeline. Saving people money on health care is one of the slogans used by Democratic Governor Jared Polis. But that slogan comes with a silent asterisk. The governor announced millions in savings on public health insurance plans. Public health options are insurance plans for people who don't get insurance from work. There will be savings, but people will pay more than last year. There are six insurance companies offering statewide plans. The State Division of Insurance said all are requesting to increase premiums next year. The lowest increase is just shy of 8%. Up 8% does not sound like savings. Hang on. Polis points out it is a smaller increase than it could have been without the state's reinsurance program, which reimburses health insurance companies for a portion of their claims. His administration did some math and said without that program, premiums would be 21 percent higher. So saving money these days is just not having as much of an increase as you might have otherwise. You need your zip code to authorize a credit card charge. You need one to mail a letter. And you might need your zip code to help your doctor figure out why you're so ill. Using COVID hospitalization data, CU Denver researchers came to the conclusion where you live can make you sicker. They hope their research can help guide future health policy for neighborhoods. The researchers pinpointed specific neighborhoods where people were likely to have worse health outcomes. Neighborhoods like Montbello, Green Valley Ranch, and Globeville, Elyria, Swansea. They took into account factors that would already contribute to severe COVID, like age and pre-existing conditions. So why is it worse in these neighborhoods? Fewer parks, more public transit, more air pollution, and more crowded living conditions. We have a lot of responsibility um, in terms of you know, public health to build neighborhoods that actually reduce the risk for people who already have that high risk and then um, really sort of even the playing field for, for neighborhoods that have historically been at risk. That's one of the researcher's co-authors, Dr. Jeremy Namath. The neighborhoods with the best health outcomes probably won't surprise you. Wash Park, Congress Park, and Hilltop. I can tell you right now, Hilltop has no gas stations and lots of trees. Those neighborhoods tend to be more walkable, less dense, and away from major transit corridors. 
This week, we have the opportunity to help build a playground where every kid can play regardless of their abilities. Here's Kyle with an update on this week's Word of Thanks. Just wanted to thank you for what you've done to help build the Berthoud Adaptive Park, the first accessible playground and park in that community in northern Colorado. Berthoud has been raising money for years to make this a reality. They're going to break ground in the fall. And since Wednesday, you've raised another $17,000 and counting to help them add more accessible playground equipment to that park. If you want to join me in giving, text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 or scan the QR code on your screen. This is going to be a big moment in that community come fall and with our help we can make a very special park even bigger and even better. Any species that gets introduced can have effects on the entire ecosystem. Colorado's appetite for fresh crawfish runs afoul of state law but that could soon change and we always end the week with something light. How about thousands of balloons just floating there? Your good news is just the lift we need next. We have a hot and dry weekend ahead. In the meantime, we do have some very spotty storms pushing their way across the front range. Right now, a live look over downtown Denver where you can see a good mix of sun and clouds, 79 degrees. Dew point not too bad, 51 degrees there, calm winds at the moment. But as we take a look at our HD Doppler radar, you can see some storms pushing their way in from the high country through the foothills and across the front range. We do have a severe thunderstorm warning in place right now. This is going to be just north of Fort Morgan over Raymer. This is going to be until around around 645. So we're going to watch for some pretty big hail from the storm. You can see how large this blue area is. That's where we're going to look for the biggest hail. You can see a few lightning strikes, maybe some locally heavy downpours, but the biggest threats are going to be the hail and the strong winds. As you take a closer look across the urban corridor here, you can see some spottier, lighter, brief storms pushing their way in from the uh, northwestern corner here, and they're going to continue to make their way across the front range. And this is right where we have a marginal risk for severe weather through the rest of the evening. So any we're along the I-25 corridor and just east of that. We're going to watch for these storms to still be pretty brief, but maybe pack a quick punch as they push through. Again, the biggest threats being hail and strong winds. Outside of that, we have an air quality alert in effect right now through tomorrow afternoon for the urban corridor. This is going to be another ozone action day. And as we go through the rest of the evening, most of us are going to stay pretty dry. Maybe a brief storm pushes through, partly cloudy, lows near 61 degrees. Tomorrow, very hot day. We're going to make it to 90 in Denver. Most of the front range in Eastern Plains in the upper 80s and low 90s. And then we only get warmer as we go into the weekend and early next week, approaching triple digits by next Monday. Tonight's next question is one we get each time we talk about Excel getting sued because of the Marshall Fire, which is now up to eight lawsuits with hundreds of victims. This is Greg from Highlands Ranch. With Excel Energy's pending litigation, my question is, are they self-insured? And if they are and do lose, would they pass that settlement on to us as consumers? Greg has a bug at my house. My wife, Jana, has asked the same question. Excel does have insurance coverage. As I found out earlier this year when Excel was found partially responsible for the 2018 explosion at Heather Gardens in Aurora, legal judgments are paid by Excel's insurance coverage. The payout is not from customers. However, the cost of the insurance policy is paid by customers. It's the part of your bill that helps Excel pay for operating costs. That's built into the base rates on your bill. So for instance, if you look at it, a base rate on your electric bill is the time of use charge you pay for electricity. I am hesitant with seafood, not because I'm in a landlocked state, but because I just didn't prefer it growing up. But there's a craving here for Louisiana crawfish, so much so that illegally imported live crawfish have made their way to Colorado for a decade. Now the state's considering lifting the import ban that clearly may not be working. Our, our Brian Wenland spent the morning with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. On a journalistic journey to catch crawfish. Yeah, this is definitely the hard way. You kind of get why people would rather just buy them. Oh, 
There was a tiny one. I almost had him. Then again, when Colorado Parks and Wildlife's Joey Livingston finally snags one. Not much uh, to eat off this one. You also see why Colorado's native crawfish need protection from invasive species. Any species that gets introduced can have effects on the entire ecosystem. People have been illegally importing live red swamp crawfish from Louisiana to eat for about a decade. Because of that interest, CPW could soon lift the ban on live imports. You know, one of our goals is to perpetuate the wildlife resources of the state, which uh, includes protecting our native species, but we're also accountable to the people of the state as well. That accountability doesn't mean our state's appetite for Louisiana mud bugs is the only consideration, though. Biological factors are gonna be a huge part of that, um, whether we're able to make regulations that can sufficiently protect our waters while still allowing people to import and consume these. Accidents happen, and an alien crawdad has already invaded Colorado's waters. It's a species brought over from the Ohio River Valley for fishing bait. The rusty crayfish is larger and more aggressive than our native species and does outcompete with them for resources. Louisiana crawfish could outcompete our native species too. But if CPW determines it can safely allow live ones to cross state lines, they could soon be on a menu near you. Importing them is definitely an easier option if you want the guaranteed meal um, rather than catching them yourself. For next, I'm Brian Wendland. Want to be heard on this? You have until next Sunday, the 30th, to let Colorado Parks and Wildlife know if you're on Team Good Food or Team Environmental Harm. You can find a link to the public comment website in this story on 9news.com. We are showing that we can make a difference through the joy of balloons. Here on Next, your joy has been making a difference for the past 341 weeks. We end this week the way we always do. Next. Dozens of balloon artists. Yeah, that's a thing. They've descended on Greeley and taken over Ames Welcome Center. It's for a good cause and the perfect setting to ask, what's your good news? It is very cool. I was not expecting it to be this big. I thought it was literally going to be like clowns, like making like balloon, like animals, like on the spot. I wasn't expecting like a whole balloon paradise. My good news is we are bringing the big balloon build to the world. We are showing that we can make a difference through the joy of balloons. It brings me back to like when I was a kid, like when I always like got balloons and stuff and like throw them up in the air. Have you ever um, blown up a balloon? No, but I, I have made them fart before. My baby brother Zane, he's turning one today at nine. My good news is that in August, I am getting another grandson. I have a grandson and he is the joy of my life. So in August, my joy gets to double. My good news is, well, I was this tooth just yesterday, and I learned how to balance my balloon thing on my hand without even touching it. My good news is that I get to see kids' joyful faces coming in and out of this big balloon build. At the end, we have a uh, popping party. It took us three and a half days to build. It's going to take about three and a half hours to take down. The proceeds from the show will go to Life Stories, a charity advocating for abused and neglected children in Weld County. Real life feedback in the mail. Coming up next. I received a package at work last week that shows, for better or worse, you think of us even when we're not on the air. Inside the envelope was this tie pin. It's a pin, but I wanted to use it as an oversized tie clip. Lori sent me the gift with this note. I saw these at the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice and thought of you. That's Italy, not California. I just picture her looking at the gift shop saying, that news guy at home would really appreciate this. And I do. Thank you, Lori.